Merry Christmas, everybody. Good to see you all. Let's uh, open with prayer, and then we'll greet each other. Lord, we thank you for this night, the chance to gather and worship you and celebrate the birth of your son, the Lord Jesus. We thank you for the life that we have in him and his love for us. We just pray your blessing in this time, a celebration of the gift of your son, Jesus. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Why don't we stand and say hello to the person near us, prepare to worship the Lord. Join me as we sing our first hymn, which is the first Noel. All six verses, 162, the first Noel.
Please be seated. I'm going to read the scripture lesson of the night. It's found in the Gospel of Matthew, first chapter, 18th verse. I invite you to turn along. It's in the Bible in the pews on page 1132. Matthew chapter 1, page 1132. Beginning in verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ took place. His mother Mary was engaged to Joseph, but before they were married, she found out that she was going to have a baby by the Holy Spirit. Joseph was a man who always did what was right, but he did not want to disgrace Mary publicly. So he made plans to break the engagement privately. While he was thinking about this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, descendant of David, Do not be afraid to take Mary to be your wife, for it is by the Holy Spirit that she is conceived. She will have a son, and you will name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all this happened in order to make true what the Lord had said through the prophet. A virgin will become pregnant and have a son, and he will be called Emmanuel, which means God is with us. So when Joseph woke up, he married Mary as the angel of the Lord had told him to, but he had no sexual relations with her before she gave birth to her son. And Joseph named him Jesus. He sends the reading of God's holy word. Anybody know the first line in the Bible? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? That's how it all begins. And uh, when you read on, he created, I, I always forget the sequence of things. He's created this, separated the light from darkness, and he separated the waters from the earth, and, and uh, created the planets and the sky, sky, and the stars, and the moon, and the celestial bodies, and he created vegetation, and he created the water and the creatures in the sea. God created animals and human beings. And I was thinking about it. If God was in a class at a school and he was given the assignment of his senior project being something to create, he did pretty well, right? I'm thinking to myself, it would be as if he was uh, combining the sciences, all kinds of science, every science that existed, you know, physics and mathematics and chemistry and all kinds of things, astronomy, bringing it all together, making all these things. So what kind of grade do you think he'd give God on his creative senior project? Pretty good, right? What's interesting is to me that uh, it wasn't just a scientific project. It was a, an ar- a work of art. Work of art. There's a woman that uh, Donna, Donna Reber in our church gave Deanna me a Christmas present. And she just took pictures that people had taken, made a book out of it, just beautiful pictures of, of uh, some of the church, some of the people in the church. Well, there's a lot of people in the church. There's also some beautiful things. <laughs> there's the sunset, just the sunset. I don't know if you've ever been to the church when the sun is setting over the cemetery. It's absolutely beautiful. Vesta took this picture. With the, the rainbow, like this rainbow right coming out of the church. I'll leave it up here if anybody wants to see it. But uh, when I think about the world that God created, it wasn't just an amazing scientific marvel. It was, a, it was an artistic marvel. Think about the beauty outside if it snow does fall <laughs> and it lands in the trees and it crystallizes and all the tiny twigs in the trees and it's just amazing. Or go down to the sea in your mind. Have you ever been to Acadian National Park in Maine and seen the water crash against the rocks? Beautiful. Have you ever seen waterfalls, Niagara Falls, Yosemite Falls, and just 
or Ricketts Glen in Pennsylvania, and just a beautiful, beautiful. Or, or rainbows, sunsets, all the things, morning sunrises, absolutely beautiful. And if I was stepping back, if we were stepping back and giving God a, a grade, I think I'd give him a B plus. Uh, so the next time maybe he'd have motivation working hard. He'd never want to get it to his head right away. Actually, he deserves an A plus, right? A plus, plus, plus. It's amazing, amazing, amazing. Question, why do you do all that? Why do you do all that? I'll come back to that question. Why did he do all that? Have you ever done anything you're proud of? Anybody here ever done anything you're proud of? Three people. That's a shame. <laughs> shame. I mean, we could, we're proud of all kinds of things, right? I hope you are. Sharon, are you proud of playing? I hope so. You, you should be proud. Are you proud as being a cook? You should be proud. Like, we should be proud. Kathy's artistic. Are you proud of that aspect of your life? You always make creative Christmas cards when you send them to us. So we could go around the room and we could say, Mylon, are you proud of digging holes? It's all he has to show for himself. It's the whole life. He's dug holes, gets covered up, and they're all gone. You know, he makes holes and then puts them away. But uh, we're proud of our things, right? And when we're proud, when I'm proud, I like to share it with somebody else. You like to share with somebody else? Here's a picture. This is a work of art. And now that was mean, Judy. She laughed at my grandkids painting here. You can't see it well. This is Heidi. It's uh, April 2016. And this is her big feet period. You know how artists always have certain periods? <laughs> and this is <laughs> it's like this is a foot, if you can't see it. Heidi made stick figures and then big monstrous feet coming out of the side. Every picture she ever drew at this particular time, I think she's progressed, like she's, it's a year later now. She's, I think she's six now. So she's progressed beyond the big feet period. But why do we have these pictures? They're on my door in my office. You can see them on the way out. Why, do, why did she give us those pictures? She's proud of that. She's proud of that. She wants to share it. And she didn't give any, did any, should she give any of you any of her pictures? No, except for Deanna and me, that's it. None of you, because she's in a relationship with you. You say, oh, that's really nice, Heidi. Doesn't mean as much to her as if I say, that's really nice, Heidi. She has a relationship with me. We're fixing up the church these days. There's just various physical improvements that need to take place. And uh, there's different places that are being painted. My office, if you go in there, the furniture's all pushed to one side. It's all a mess. I don't know if you can tell much difference from normally the way I treat the room. But uh, the room's been painted. A variety of rooms have been painted. The guy that painted the rooms in the church is, is a professional painter, Steve King, who's a member of our church. And uh, one night, I came here. We were having a 6 o'clock, 6.30 meeting, something like that. Steve was just finishing up with his painting. Uh, of a room. And Donna King, his wife, also a member of the church, was going to be at the meeting with me. So Donna came in, and I'd just been looking at whatever Steve had painted. I was talking to Steve, and Steve and I and Donna encountered each other in the hall, and Steve said to his wife, w would you like to see what I did today? And she said, I'd love to. And they went to the room, whatever the room was. I don't know what room it was. It doesn't matter what room it was. They went to the room, and she went, That's, that looks really good. Now, don't tell him. But it's just a wall. It's not, it's not as good as this. <laughs> it's just a, it was just, you know, it's wall. But it's really, he does really, really, really good work. I'm not kidding you. He does good work. But here he is. He's my age. He wants to show his wife the wall he painted. And then we, we yanked off... Uh, there was drywall in the belfry and it was getting musty and moldy in there. And we got advice and they said, rip this stuff off, ripped it all off so it's better in that room. And it's dark. So Mylon says, paint, paint the stone that's in there so it brightens it up, and it did. And Steve said, Donnie, you want to see the, the belfry? So we went over to the belfry. Why did Steve do that? Because he was proud of that. And he wanted to share it with someone with whom he had a relationship. Hmm. 
You know, the Bible says we were created in the image of God. What does that really mean? Created in the image of God. What it means is that we're similar to God, and if we're similar to God, he's similar to us. We have some similarities between us and God. So I return to the original question. Why, why did God create this incredible world in which we live that's not only a scientific marvel, but also a creative artistic marvel? Why did he do that? Because he wanted somebody to share it with. Because a God, we worship a God who desires actual relationship with us. He desires relationship. And he wants to share the world that he made with us. Now watch this. He's creating the image of God. Turn over to the next chapter of scripture. Genesis chapter 2 verse 18. Listen to what God says. Keep in mind that we were created in the image of God. We are similar to him. He's similar to us. Watch this. It says he's created Adam. Okay. It goes to verse 18. And it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. Where would God ever get that idea from? Why would God ever assess Adam and say, you know what? <laughs> this isn't going to work out well for Adam if he's living life alone. This isn't good for Adam. Where would God ever get that idea from? Keeping in mind that God created us in his image. What was going on there? God doesn't want to be alone. If it's not good for man to be alone, it's not good for God to be alone. Because we were created in the image of God, and God says, you know what? Adam's not doing well right now. i got to create someone to be a partner to him in his life. So the reason God created Eve was so that Adam would go through life alone, that Adam could enjoy life in relationship, and when Adam dug a hole or painted a wall or drew a picture as a child, he could share it with somebody else, Eve. So back to the original question. Why did God create the world? And then us? So he could have someone to share life with. In a profound way, listen to this, in a profound way, God desires to have a relationship with you on a level you have no idea. God is I hesitate to say this, but I think it might be true. God is lonely without a relationship with you. He's lonely. That's maybe too strong a word, but he really desires a relationship with you. Don't underestimate that. Now, let me back up my statement that God is lonely without you, and I want to turn over to another scripture in Ephesians. This is what it says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. It says... Even before he, God, made the world, okay? Even before the world was made, God loved us. Candy? See if you agree with me. The rest of you agree with me. Even before the world was made, God loved Candy. Do you agree with that or not? He did. He knew about Candy's eventual coming into existence. He knew about her. It says, it says, even before God made the world, God loved Candy and chose Candy that she would be in Christ and she, he wanted her to be holy and without fault in his eyes, like a father. Having a fondness for his daughter, this is no fault in his eye for her. That's what he wants. He wants her to be his daughter. Do you see that? God decided in advance to adopt Candy into his own family by bringing Candy to himself through Jesus Christ. Do you understand what I'm saying? God created the world, and he didn't want to experience it alone. He created us, Candy, as, I, as my example, created Candy that he could share the world with her. Because he desired a relationship with her. Listen to the next line. It says, God decided in advance to adopt us into his family by bringing us into him, to himself through Christ Jesus. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. 
God gets great pleasure out of his relationship with you. Great pleasure. I want to ask you something. We are to a large degree self-centered people, are we not? We really are. We, we think largely about ourselves. I want to know something. Do you care about God's feelings? I never even think about God's feelings. Do you think about God's feelings? I, in a certain sense, I don't know that I think about his feelings. God wants to have relationships with us, and absent that relationship, God is not fully satisfied. He wants a relationship with you. A deep and meaningful, engaging, rich relationship with you. And he created the world that he wanted to share with you and he wanted to bring you into a relationship with him and his mechanism to do that is through the birth of Jesus Christ and Jesus growing up and dying on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins so that when we acknowledge that Jesus died for us and we place our faith and trust in him, he will forgive us of our sins and we can have an eternal relationship with him. That's the whole deal. That's the deal. And some of you might be sitting here tonight and thinking, hey, wait, wait a minute, what date? what's the day today? What's the day today? Is this Christmas or what? What's he talking about? <laughs> I haven't even talked about Christmas, have I? You know what I'm talking about tonight? This is all about Christmas. You know what it is? It's about the why of Christmas. You know the facts about Christmas. You know Joseph, Mary, the baby, the wise men, the shepherds, and all that stuff, and the donkeys. and You know all about that. I'm talking tonight not about those details. I'm talking about the why of Christmas. And the why of Christmas is because we worship a God who is highly personal. And he craves a relationship not with everybody else in the world. He craves a relationship with you. Take this sermon personally. This is me being called by God to speak on his behalf to say to you, Don, I want a relationship with you. That's deep and meaningful and personal. That's what I want. That's what God has called me to say tonight. He wants a relationship with you. So I want to ask you something. I want you to reflect and I want you to be honest. Okay? Don't give me the right answer. I already know the right answer to the question. I want you to be honest. Everybody here. Okay? Engage with me. Honestly. Try to be really honest. It's hard to be honest sometimes. Try to think about this one. I want you to rank the relationships that you have in your life, mentally inside your head right now, and prioritize who is, or what are, I should say it probably that way, what are the most important relationships in your life right now? Everybody in the room. Rank them. Okay, think about it. Okay, I'll give you some examples so you can sequence them, change the sequence. Okay, your spouse, if you're married. Okay? Your, your, your children, or your parents, your siblings, Maybe your grandchildren, your neighbors, your whoever they are, best friends, your classmates, your coworkers, your high school buddy, that your college roommate, God, and other. I'll put other in there. You get, got all these different categories? Now honestly rank them. Now there's a, a there's an acronym J O Y. Do you know that one? Jesus, others, you. Forget that. That's the right answer. Forget that right answer. Take a moment. Rank the relationships in terms of their importance in your life. Where does God stand in that ranking? How low does he fall? Just think about it. Think about it for a minute. Scripture says, for God so loved the world, and we can insert your own name, for God so loved Candy, that he gave his only son, that if Candy believes in him, she will not perish, but have eternal life. The why of Christmas is that God loved you. Fonda, God loves you. And wants to have a fulfilling, satisfying, deep, permanent relationship with you. That's the why of Christmas. 
That's, beyond, that's deeper than the facts. That's why Jesus came, and it was God's idea that Jesus come. It was God's idea that Jesus came because he wanted a relationship with you. And it's beyond my mind's able, ability to comprehend how God could want a personal relationship with the, the hundred people that are in the room or whatever, but, but he does. God is God, and he can individually want a relationship with every single one of us in this room and desire it. Now, in, in years past, uh, I, I will pitch this. I'll say, hey, if you want a relationship with God, here's what you need to do. Pray this prayer. Uh, God, thank you for loving me. I acknowledge it of sin. Thank you for dying on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins. And now I open the door of my life and come in and be my savior. And I think that's a very important prayer. I hope everybody in this room prayed that prayer. But that's not a relationship. He wants something more than that. That's like me coming up to Mike and saying, Mike, you want to be a friend? Yeah, friend. And never talk to Mike again. We might be friends, I guess. We label it as friends. Do you agree that we're friends? Yeah, we agree we're friends. And, and we walk away. We never talk to each other. We may, I guess, be friends. But that's not a very satisfying relationship. And God says, I want a relationship. So what, is a, what does a relationship look like? What does a relationship with God look like? Are you, tr are you tracking with me tonight? Because I'm thinking these thoughts. This is interesting for me, and I hope it's interesting to you. What does a relationship with God look like? Let me, let me say something, and I'll get to that point. When Jesus came into the world, he was God in the flesh. It, Jesus was God with skin on. He put the suit on. Jesus put skin on, but he was really God in the flesh. And to know Jesus is to know God. So if, if we had an opportunity to directly interact with Jesus, or interact with Jesus through the Bible... When we interact with Jesus, we're actually interacting with God. We understand who God is, best of all, through a living example, and the living example is Jesus. So we, we, may, we might say, I believe as a principle God is good, but I believe in reality God is good because Jesus was good. Do you understand? So we understand the character of God when we experience Jesus. We understand the nature of God when we understand the nature of Jesus. We understand how God would relate to people in, in terms of setting example when we watch how Jesus related to people. We understand God through Jesus, okay? So when I said earlier that God desires a relationship with Candy or with Fonda, when I said that, what kind of relationship does he seek? What kind of relationship does God want with, with Fonda? The best I can do is look at the kind of relationship Jesus had with real flesh and blood human beings. And I say, that example of how Jesus related to human beings in a relational sense is the kind of experience that God wants with you. Keep in mind what you, how you rank God in your priority list of relationships. Think about where he was in that list. Because if God's not at the top of the list... Let's just say you and God are out of sync because you're at the top of his list. Do you understand that? You are at the top of God's list. I don't comprehend how Fonda could be at the top of his list and Candy be at the top of his list, but somehow God is God and that's true. I believe that's true. You're at the top of his list. And if he's not at the top of your list, that's okay, but there's, there's a disconnect there. So what is that relationship that God desires with you, Fonda, look like? And if you don't like picking on me, next time you sit back where you belong, okay? Okay, no, no. Oh, it's this idea, okay. So, okay, hang in there. And, and you all should be glad you sat back there. No wonder you sit all the way in the back. I can barely see you. As I get older, I'll, I'll never be able to see you. But anyway, that's another story. Here's the best example of a relationship with God that I think we have that's unfiltered. And it's a relationship that he had with three siblings. Now, I could go with the disciples, but the disciples were disciples. These guys, this family, they were just his friends. They were his friends first, disciples second. The disciples were disciples first, friends second. He, he wants a relationship with you more than he wants you to do something for him. Okay? He wants a relationship with you. So watch this. 
He had a relationship with three people, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, probably all equally. I think he loved them all the same. They were siblings, Mary, Martha, and their boy, Lazarus. And one time Lazarus got sick, really sick, going to die. The brother's dying. And Mary and Martha's tears welled up in their eyes, and they were upset. There was no ER to call. There was no 911. There was only one person who could help them, and that was Jesus. And they sent out a call through a messenger, get Jesus to come quickly. And he showed up four days late. And when he got there, John 11 is where the story is. Everybody was grieving, and they knew how to grieve. They weren't PA Dutch there, where you bottle up your emotions and hold it all in. How are you doing? I'm fine. No, they britzed. And so everybody was britzing. And Jesus showed up. And the women, the sisters were saying, where were you, Jesus? Where were you, Jesus? Lazarus is dead, Jesus. Where were you? And there's a conversation. You can read it for yourself. That's not the point for tonight. There was a conversation back and forth. Jesus finally said, what you might say. Where is he? Where's his body? He said, you know the cave out there, family tomb? That's where he is. He's in there. Jesus went outside the cave. Are you picturing this with me? It's grass. It's a cave. There's a stone rolled in front because that's what they did. And... Uh, there were people there that were not Pennsylvania Dutch, and they were weeping. And Jesus was there. And you know what happened? Jesus broke down. Jesus broke down. Listen to this. 11th chapter, 35th verse. It says, Jesus said, where, where did they place him? They said, Lord, come and see. And they brought, somebody brought him to the tomb. And he's, it says, then Jesus wept. I have a question for you. Think if Fonda died, Jesus would weep? Do you think Jesus would weep if Fonda died? Yeah, he would. Why would he weep over Fonda dying? Because he loves Fonda. Fonda is his number one person. He loves Fonda. He loves Fonda. So, we, we, but we don't see, I've never seen Jesus weep over Fonda. Have you ever seen that? I've never seen that. But why would I suggest that Jesus would weep if Fonda died? Because my understanding of God comes from my understanding of Jesus. If, if Jesus wept over Lazarus, then Jesus would weep over Fonda. That's a representation of God's love. Now watch this. Jesus weeps over Lazarus. And remember, he's also weeping over Fonda. And the people who are watching him, the people who are watching Jesus weep, make an observation that's profound. Then Jesus wept. The he people who were standing by, standing nearby said, oh my goodness, see how much he loved Lazarus? And they were overwhelmed. They said, Jesus really loved Lazarus. What's that supposed to mean to us when we try to understand what does it really mean to have a relationship with God? And let me tell you, it's far more profound than praying a prayer and saying, now we're friends, I'll see you later. It's much more profound than that. Jesus wept over Lazarus and people were blown away and they said, whoa, I never knew the magnitude of that love. And Jesus loves Fonda and he loves you that much and you know what? Let's all confess it. We don't have a clue. We don't have a clue. We don't have a clue how much Jesus loves us. We have no clue how much Jesus loves us. We, we, can't, even, we can't even begin to imagine the magnitude of Jesus' love. Can't imagine it. A number of years ago, I read a story about a father named Bill Hybels. He's a pastor of a large church west of Chicago. The story of years ago, <coughs> Bill Hybels is a guy that loves sailboats. He's been sailing his whole life. <coughs> Excuse me, and his son, Todd, when Todd was five or six, let's just say this. If I did what 
Bill Hybels did with his son, with my son, my wife would have killed me. Okay, that's just the, that's just the way it is. So when Todd was five or six, Bill Hybels took Todd uh, windsurfing. Anybody here ever windsurf? Nobody ever windsurfed? Nobody. Oh, Larry, how to finally fess up. Okay. Well, I've windsurfed. Did you successfully windsurf, Larry? That's a different matter for me, too. My, my father still lived on Long Island, which was much better for me. <laughs> Father-in-law. Father-in-law lived on Long Island. I'm making an in-law joke, Deanna. When my in-laws still lived on Long Island, my father-in-law bought a, a windsurfer, which is nothing more than a sailboat with a, I mean, a, a, a surfboard, large surfboard with a sail in the middle. And you're supposed to stand on the board. And you, I know one of the words is tack and something else, and you throw this thing around, the sail around, and you let the sail take you on the surfboard thing out into the Long Island Sound and then back again. And if you're really good, you can go and then guess what I did? I fell off the board. I couldn't even stand on the board, let alone do anything with it. But Bill Hybels, he's a sail, sailor type guy, so he takes his son windsurfing, but his son, son can't, can swim, but not really well. Bill's an expert swimmer, and they go out without See, I'm trying to engage you yeah, with life jackets. Okay, see, I, I got you awake. And uh, they go out, and Bill takes his son on his shoulders, Deanna. Would you accept that? No, she wouldn't accept that. So Bill's an expert at this windsurfing thing. And this five- or six-year-old kid, you wouldn't let your kids do it either with your husband, I'm sure, because you're going to protect your kids. So the, Bill's son is on his shoulders, and he goes out, and it's a th they are good. And they go out, they go out like a quarter mile onto Lake Michigan, because he lives in Chicago area. They go out in Lake Michigan, way out and back, out and back. And they've done this many, many, many times. Kid loves it. Todd loves it. It's one day we're out and having fun, windsurfing in Lake, Lake Michigan. And they got back to shore, <coughs> and uh, Bill said to his son, well, we better go home now. It's time to go home. Kid was a kid. You know what kids are like. They're pain in the neck sometimes. Oh, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. Bill said, we can't do it again because there's a storm coming. You can see those clouds over there. The storm's coming. Kid says, come on, Dad, come on. We can do it one more time. Quick, we can do it one more time. You can do it. I can do it. And Bill, against his better judgment, said, all right, Todd, we'll do it one more time. Just one more time, though. That's it. One more time. And Todd says, oh, good, 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 Dad, good, Dad. So he gets on the shoulders of his father, and they windsurf out, quarter mile out. And sure enough, those clouds that were in the sky were not kidding. <laughs> Storm begins to come on Lake Michigan, and it's crazy, and it's blowing, and waves are crashing. I mean, it's Lake Michigan, but there's like serious, serious waves going on here, serious wind, and they get blown off the board. And they get blown off the board, and Bill goes one way, and the sun goes the other. And the waves are like this kind of deal. And Bill lost his son. Now, his son can swim, but not well. He was a kid. And Bill says, and I think Bill, unlike me, I, 80%, my stories are 80% accurate. I think his story is 100% accurate. He says, I could not see my son for a solid minute, 60 seconds. I couldn't see my son. And he said, I, I screamed at the top of my lungs, Todd! And he screamed and screamed and screamed. He said he screamed so loud and for such a long time. He said his voice was hoarse for a solid week. Literally. Because he screamed that loudly and so, with so much panic. He needed to find his son. And he couldn't see him. And what was going on is the, the wave's here and the, the bill's here and the sun's here and it was always between them. And he couldn't find him until finally after about a minute he saw this little uh, blonde haired kid head popping up and he swam over immediately to his kid and got him and threw him on the board and it got back safely. And he said to his son, hey, this is one of the father-son events. We don't need to be telling your mother about it. <laughs> I've had plenty of those events. That's how much God loves you. 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 Do you understand? 
That's how much God loves you. And God is not satisfied with that prayer. I mean, that prayer is a starting point. That's a good thing. But he wants more from you than just a prayer. He wants a relationship. Now, I want to backtrack. Where are you in that relationship with God? Come on, let's be honest. No point to not being honest. You don't have to say anything out loud, but honest examination. Come on. Think for a moment. You engage with me? What's the nature of your relationship with God right now through Jesus Christ? On a scale of 110 in terms of tightness. Where are you at? Let me tell you something. God wants a really solid relationship with you. A solid relationship with you. A real relationship that's personal and alive and vibrant. Now, help me understand, how was it that, that Todd had such a good relationship with the dad? How'd that happen? Just one day, Todd said to his father, hey, dad, can we be best friends? His father said, sure, we're best friends. Never made any more investment in that. Is that how it happened? Uh uh. Before Todd was born, Bill was praying for his son. When his son was born, Bill held his son in his arms. Bill changed his son's diapers. Bill began to play games on the floor. Bill began to roll cars and Legos and build Legos. And he, Bill loved sailing, so he introduced his son early to his passions and they began to share. The reason Bill went windsurfing with his kid was because they had gone many, many times before windsurfing. They invested in that mutual relationship. Let me ask a different question. Are you satisfied? Everybody. I'm asking everybody. All right? Are you satisfied with the relationship that you have with God? Really? Are you satisfied with it? Corollary question, is God satisfied with the relationship he has with you? If the answer is no, and if you have compassion for God and care about his feelings and his perspective, I want to challenge you to do something about that and not pray a prayer. You can pray a prayer, but I think it needs to be more than that. I've said it throughout the day today. My challenge this year for Christmas is that you give, especially if you're, you know in your heart your relationship isn't what it should be or what you want it to be or what God wants it to be, then I challenge you to invest the next three months of your life to genuinely pursuing him and not playing games and not going through the motions. I've had different examples throughout the day, through the morning services, the other services, of people who have developed relationship with God, and I won't bother sharing any of those stories. All I know is if you pursue God in a genuine sense over the course of the next three months, six months, things are going to change. It begins by going to church faithfully and really genuinely getting into it, not going through the motions. And it also has something to do with partnering up with people that you admire spiritually, that you think are, ha have their spiritual act together, not going through the motions, not faking you out, but really have a genuine, authentic faith. These people could be in church. It could be where you work. It could be in your neighborhood. It could be a family member. It could be anybody. But partner up with somebody else and really walk the walk for the next three months, preferably the next six months even longer. And I tell you, you start reading the Bible a little bit, don't have to read volumes, just a little bit, but genuinely read it, try to figure it out, pray before you do. Start praying to God in a way that you're really pursuing him, not just seeking help with your problems because I'm distressed about whatever it is you're distressed about, but pursuing him for him. And you know what? Next year you come to this Christmas Eve service? I was going to say, you're going to be a different person. No, that's not true. You're not going to be a different person. You're going to have a different relationship. And you're going to be enhanced. Your life will be enhanced by the relationship that you have with God. Because that's what he wants. He wants a relationship with you that's much deeper than what it is today. What are you going to do about that? 
And again, you're saying to me, what does this have to do with Christmas? This is the why. This is why God so loved the world. This is why God said, I'm going to send my son out of the splendor of heaven and, and having a cushy life, and I'm going to send him into a pitsy world for the shot at enabling a relationship between God and you to happen. That's why Christmas occurred. Because God desires a relationship with you. And I'm challenging you to not just say, well, that's over, let's go home, let's open up the presents and drink our hot chocolate or whatever you do and sing or whatever you do. I'm saying make a commitment tonight, tonight. Make a commitment inside yourself. I'm going to do a full court press in pursuing a relationship with God over the course of the next blank months. You choose the amount and make it happen. You won't be sorry. And most importantly, God will be pleased because he desires a relationship with you more than you could ever imagine. Let me pray. Lord, I, I pray that... Uh, the people here would get what you were trying to say. I pray that I would get what you were trying to say uh, to me as well as to them. Because this is not just a message just for me. This is a message for me and they together as you want a relationship. And I pray, Lord God, that your Holy Spirit would be stirring among us, every one of us in this room, and that we would respond to the stirring of the Spirit and that the relationship would really develop. And that we wouldn't be celebrating next year the birth of Jesus in Nativity a long, long time ago. But we would be celebrating the rebirth and rebirth and rebirth of Christ in our own personal hearts and lives. Lord, I pray, Holy Spirit, come to every single person in this room right now and really pursue them and help us all, and myself included, to yield to your wishes for that relationship. Lord God, do that. Do that, Lord God. Do that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. This time we're going to receive our morning off or evening. We'll take it. Well, we're going to take a morning offering just several hours late. That's what we're going to do. There we go. <clears throat>
We're going to follow the service of communion, which is found in the inserted pages in front of your hymnal, page A6. A6. <clears throat> we have brought to the Lord's table with their offerings of bread and wine for the Lord's Supper. We invite to this table all who are members of a church, a Christian church, who desire peace with their neighbor and who seek the mercy of God. Look, the evangelist wrote of our risen Lord that when he was at table with two of the disciples, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Their eyes were open. They recognized him. In company with all believers, in every time and beyond time, we come to this table to know him in the breaking of the bread. For the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord God. We give you thanks, Lord God, our Creator, for bringing the worlds into being, for forming us in your likeness, for recalling us when we rebel against you, and for keeping the world in your steadfast love. We praise you especially for Jesus Christ, who was born of Mary and lived as one of us, and knew exactly the life that we know, and yet was obedient to your purposes, even to his death on a cross. We thank you that you stamped his death with victory by raising him in power and by making him head over all things. We rejoice in the continuing presence of the Holy Spirit in the, ca uh, in the church you've gathered, in the task of obedience, and in the promise of eternal life. With the faithful, in every place and time, we praise with joy your holy name. Holy. bless now by your word and spirit both us and these gifts of bread and wine that in receiving them at this table in an offering here our faith and praise we may be united with Christ and one another and remain faithful to the tasks he sets before us in the strength Christ gives we offer ourselves to you giving thanks that you have called us to serve you amen Through the bread, we participate in the body of Jesus Christ. And through the cup of blessing, we celebrate the new life that he gives. Come for all things are ready. You may be seated.
bread, which we hold in our hands, is just a piece of bread, but it represents somebody who lived, died with you in mind. He died because he loved you. He died to pave the way for us to have a relationship with his Father through him. Eat the bread in remembrance of Jesus' sacrifice for your relationship. In one of the uh, accounts of the communion service with the Last Supper with the disciples, Jesus made a statement how he longs. This is the last time he's going to drink the wine with them until he drinks it again in the kingdom. And you get a sense he longs for that day to come when he'll drink wine with them and with us in his kingdom 
as friends of his. Let's drink the wine in anticipation of the day when we come into his presence and live with him for all eternity. You may drink the wine. There's a prayer printed in your, in your hymnal on page A8 in the bold face print. You can remain seated, and we're going to pray this prayer together. Page A8, the inserted pages. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of your Son, Jesus Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world in courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Let's have a closing prayer. Lord God, we just thank you again for this night of celebration of the birth of your son, Jesus, and the understanding of your desire for relationship with us. We bless you for that. We bless your holy name. We thank you, and we pray your Holy Spirit would be alive and moving in each and every one of our lives to your glory and honor always. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, love of God, fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore, world without end. Amen. God bless you. Merry Christmas.